Hi, Jan Coates here uh, from my creating room in Wolfville, Nova Scotia, where it's very snowy today, and I'm on a 14-day isolation since I just got back from uh, the state of Georgia in the United States. I'm finding lots to do, and um, I'm a little worried about publishing as a result of this economic downturn that's going along with the COVID-19 crisis. And uh, publishers are asking us um, to contribute some online content. So I thought I'd read a little bit from uh, my middle grade novel, Say What You Mean, Mean What You Say, published by Trapdoor Books, which is part of Nevermore Publishing in Lunenburg, Nova Scotia. Um, I'm going to read uh, the first chapter and then part of another chapter. Um, I just wanted to tell you briefly why I wrote this book. Um, many years ago in the 1980s, uh, like a lot of young Maritimers, I lived in Toronto for a couple of years. And as I took the streetcar to work every day, I saw a man um, who was sleeping in the bus shelter every night. And I didn't ever get off the bus at that stop or at the streetcar at that stop, but um, he stayed in my mind. And I think he's the reason I wrote this story. And it's the story of 12-year-old Jake McKinnon. The Beginning, Chapter 1. I didn't even know you were lost and needed to be found until we saw the note under one of the scratch-and-sniff pizza magnets on the fridge. One of those yellow sticky notes you keep in your shirt pocket. The ones you leave me riddle clues on when we play hide-and-seek up at Graham's. Only this was one messed up clue. Gone out west to find myself sorry. After we first read it, Mom put the note back, tried to laugh, pretend it was some kind of joke. Only her mouth was laughing. Her eyes looked more like crying, all shiny and red around the rims, like some white mouse. Isn't out west kind of far away, I asked, if we're in the middle, sort of. She twisted a long brown curl around her pointer finger and stared out the tiny kitchen window at the brick wall next door. Guess that depends on how far out west Dad went. And he should be sorry. He didn't even say when he'd be home. I always have to. Alfie will call. She pushed my hair behind my ears, then dropped her hands onto my shoulders. Try to be patient, Jake. I am trying, but being patient is hard when you're 12. And three and a half months is a very long time. Where are you? Coach Gomez pushes in the last tack, but I can already see that my name's not on the list. Turning away from the bulletin board, he pats me on the head like I'm six or something. Sorry, Jake, you almost made it. Maybe in the fall after you've had a growth spurt. Why not just drive that tack straight into my eyeball? My face bursts into flames and my eyes start leaking, like I just took a penalty shot in the nose. I blink fast, read the list again, then take off running. Almost made it. That's like saying you almost won the lottery. Who gives a dog turd? A hard yank on my ponytail jerks me to a stop. What kind of idiot does that? The best friend kind of idiot. Echoes all bent over, hands on her knees, puffing and panting. Didn't you hear me? I turn away, wipe my eyes on my sleeve. Trying to give me whiplash? Bug off. Well, excuse me. Grabbing hold of my backpack by both straps, I slam it into a fire hydrant twice. Didn't make the stupid team. Soccer? No tiddlywinks. Frickin' suck up Connor Kowalski. Runs like Graham chasing her chickens, only he made it. Echo gives me a one eyebrow lift then turns her ball hat around backwards. That's unfortunate. Stinks even. Like dog crap. Don't you mean feces? Hang on a sec. She sits down on a big stump to tie her shoe. Those new? Sort of. They were my mom's from when she was 11. Vintage Adidas, circa 1985. Seriously? Why would anybody save those old beat up things for like 30 years? Must be a hippie technophobe thing. I love them. She finishes one perfect bow, doubles it, then moves on to the other one. Maybe it's because of your ponytail. Maybe the coach has gender issues. Who knows? Kept telling me how good I was doing at tryouts. I kicked the stump hard. Probably felt sorry for me because I'm a midget. Why don't people say what they really mean? The truth. 
A chunk of bark flies off. I pick it up and boot it back into the schoolyard. Like who? Besides the coach, I mean. My dad decides he's lost, goes off to find himself. What does that even mean? Ahoy, mateys, clear the decks. What the? We jump off the sidewalk into the dead leaf crud in the gutter and just miss getting rammed by a rusty shopping cart full of bottles and cans, being pushed by an old guy wearing a pirate hat and an eye patch. Long John Silver steaming through. About 50 toy boats dangle off the sides of his cart, and a bulgy-eyed bulldog is all smashed back into one corner. Is it just me, or are crazy psycho freaks taking over the whole entire city? Echo stops walking, shoves her hands into her back pockets, then squeezes her lips together, which makes her look like the cookie monster without the blue furry bits. People don't choose to be mentally ill. Same as people don't choose to get cancer or be short. It just happens. Probably he had some great tragedy in his life, something catastrophic that we don't have a sweet clue about. Whatever, not my fault. What am I, a mind reader? Same as I don't have a clue about why your dad took off. There's some stuff kids aren't supposed to know about adults. It's for our own good. Mom says Echo's an old soul, whatever that means. One weird thing about Echo is that she talks like her mom, who's some kind of counselor. But I like knowing what's going on. Wish I could read minds. Ever hear the expression, mind your own business? Yeah, but that's for nosy people, not me. Saw the show the other day about this new software they're working on for mind reading. It's unfrickin' believable. Echo pats her mouth and yawns. Unbelievably boring. No, listen, seriously. They're going to be able to steal thoughts right out of people's brains, read their brain waves, then write them on a screen. Honestly, that would be horrible. She makes a yuck face. Well, except for nonverbal people, guess it would be a relief for them. And for judges, I start taking giant steps and talking faster. Criminals couldn't lie in court because the magic mind reader would show the truth. Echo jogs along beside me. She's got super skinny baby giraffe legs. Let's be honest, mind reading is an invasion of privacy, majorly. Imagine having the whole world knowing what you're thinking. That'd just be creepy. I always tell the truth. Well, yeah, but that's not the same as saying everything you're thinking right out loud. Maybe they'll come up with a mind reading program that'll work online. Keep people from making stuff up, living a fake life on the World Wide Web. For sure, it must be way easier to lie when you're not looking right at the other person. Echo leans in, sticks her face in front of mine, then crosses her brown eyes. Little old technophobe me doesn't have to worry about that being offline and all. I snort and push her away. But mind reading would be wicked. I'd know everything and I'd be rich. Who would pay you to read minds? Some magician? A fortune teller? The military. I flip up my hood, pull my t-shirt up over the bottom half of my face and hunch over. Super spy Jake McKinnon stopping terrorists in their tracks since 2018. Right. Good luck with that. Our first league games next week. At least you can still play in the rec team with us dreadfully uncool people. Soccer rejects. And now I gotta go practice. She mimes playing the violin. Hey, how sweet would that be? If I could read minds, I'd know where people were gonna put the ball before they even took a shot. Why don't you just wish for a fairy godmother or a genie? Dream on, Aladdin. Just going to skip ahead a bit to the part where um, Jake and his mom go to the pound looking for a dog to adopt. And the dog turns out to be Sandy, who we'll meet in this section. When the fire whistle across the street blows, Sandy points her snout up at the ceiling and howls right along with it. It's hilarious for about three seconds. Then every other dog in the place joins in. I plug my ears. Great acoustics, eh? She'd make a super watchdog, Bill shouts, if that's what you're looking for. Mom folds her hands under her chin and looks down at Sandy without blinking. But she's smiling, like when she holds Gregory, our neighbor's baby. At least she's not yappy, I say. It's your dog, Jake. Mom says, finally, your birthday. Your father always had hounds growing up. What do you think? Dad turned into your father when he took off. Maybe mom figures a dog will fill the big empty dad spot in the apartment. Sandy stops howling, then woofs and shoves her big head up in under my armpit. 
I stare at her messed up eyes. Her long floppy ears feel like this old velvet rabbit I used to drag around. Bun Bun. I left him in the library one day when I was five, but he was gone when we went back to look for him. I squint at Sandy, then crouch down, blink about ten times, and rub my eyes. Did she just give me a wink and a smile? I look away, then back. She does it again. I look at Mom to see if she noticed, but she's busy digging in her backpack, trying to find her ancient cell that's ringing like a bike bell. So what happens if we don't take her? I ask. Euthanasia. Bill closes his eyes and holds his hands together like a pillow under his cheek. We'll have to put her to sleep. Sandy groans and lays one of her front paws in her head on my shoulder. I stand up. Really? How? It's not painful. The vet uses a needle to give the dogs pentobarbital. Only takes a few seconds to send them off to their great reward. Reward? Sounds like murder to me. Okay, we'll take her. Sandy jumps up on me again, slams me back against the wall, licking my face like I'm a popsicle. Back off, dog breath. I wipe my face on the sleeve of my hoodie. You're coming with us, but you gotta chill with the kissy face stuff, seriously. Mom drops her cell back into her bag, then digs out her pink Hello Kitty wallet. Gotta run. Somebody called in sick and they're short a waitress. It's just for a couple of hours until the two-for-one Tuesday rush is over. She turns to Bill. How much do we owe you? Sixty dollars should do it, he says, cheaper than some because we didn't have to get her spayed. She already ate, so she's good to go. We thank him, hook on the borrowed leash we brought, and head outside. The rain's gone, and the sun's trying to come out. It's hard to tell with all that skin bagging off her face, but I'm pretty sure Sandy's smiling the whole way home. Me too. I'm going to skip ahead a couple of chapters here. Uh, when we find out uh, who Sandy really is. So Jake's in bed in this, in this segment. I sniff a couple of times, then turn over. It was always Dad that crawled into bed with me when I was sick or had monster nightmares when I was little. Wish he could meet Sandy. I move my cheek away from the damp spot on my pillow and concentrate on deep breathing. The only thing I learned in the one yoga class Echo dragged me to in out, in, out. I'm almost asleep when somebody, somebody heavy slams into my back, making my eyes jerk open. I roll over and snuggle my wet face into Sandy's warm neck. Good girl. She makes these sweet dog grumbling sounds, almost like she's trying to talk. My brain's in yo-yo mode and my stomach starts growling. I sit up and squint at the stove. Eleven o'clock already. I flick on the lamp Dad made out of a banged up old trumpet he found on the street one time. Want a snack? Sandy lifts up her head, thumps her tail, and shakes her head side to side and clears her throat, like an old fogey getting ready to spit. Her blubbery black lips flap up and down and her eyebrows squirm like caterpillars. I start losing it, bury my face in my pillow so I won't wake up Mom. What pray tell is so delightfully amusing? What the? I stop laughing, twist around, and check the kitchen. Is it the old British lady from down the hall that wanders in for tea sometimes? Did Mom forget to close the apartment door? I get out of bed. Nope. It's shut tight, and the chain lock is hooked. I check Mom's door, still closed. I said, what is so amusing? Please be so kind as to share the joke. I look down. Sandy looks up. She lifts one eyebrow, echo style, and gives me a wink with her blue eye. Whoa! I back up and sit down on the living room window sill. Uh, um, is your caterpillar eyebrows? I give myself a shake. Am I dreaming? Sandy frowns and pats one eyebrow with a paw. What is so entertaining about my eyebrows? Are you for real or am I losing it? Sandy jumps down off the bed, grabs onto my hand with her sharp yellow teeth, and presses them into my skin, gently. Do my incisors feel authentic? I pull my hand away carefully, then wipe the slobber off on my t-shirt. But, but dogs don't talk. I tell her they bark. I will admit I am a rare breed, but please do lower your voice. We most definitely do not want your poor, tired mother to wake up, Sandy whispers. This is highly confidential. 
I dropped back down onto the daybed. This is epic. Could you always talk? Did the shelter guy know? She shakes her head. Only you. I am your fairy dog mother, she whispers back. You saved my life, and from your tears, it would appear you are in need of my services. Your every wish is my command. She pauses. Well, your every wish, so long as you have only one. And I'll leave Sandy and Jake there. Uh, Nevermore Press is having uh, uh, free shipping uh, for this month or for the uh, near future, I guess. Uh, if you'd like to read more of Jake and Sandy's story, you can get in touch with them online. Thanks so much for listening. <laughs>